A broken washing machine, old cars, piles of used newspaper, obsolete bottles, old computers, cell phones, tablets, plasma screens. When the things of daily life are no longer useful, we cast them off. For centuries, man has struggled with how to handle this problem. However, from the earliest days of our nation, we've learned to recycle. In the 19th century, railroads were buying and selling scrap metal. At the beginning of the 20th century, the emerging steel and automobile industries made recycling scrap metal a necessary and profitable business. Waves of immigrants found opportunities to gain a foothold in the American economy. And soon, family enterprises became businesses, and those businesses became a challenging but thriving industry. At the beginning of the last century, recyclers were fiercely independent and loosely organized. In 1913, however, the first trade association was formed. Over the decades that followed, the industry and its associations have continued to evolve in the face of changing times to become a vital part of the global economy. Today, the growing U.S.-based scrap recycling industry employs over 135,000 people and generates more than $100 billion in annual sales, including roughly $40 billion in export sales. The industry annually recycles more than 130 million metric tons of obsolete materials and manufactures it into vital feedstocks while using dramatically less energy and conserving precious natural resources. From a humble past, recycling has become one of the most vital and essential industries of the future. The immigrants who arrived in America in the early 1900s learned that collecting cast-off materials such as textiles, metal, and paper and selling them to manufacturers was a rewarding way to overcome language barriers, lack of capital, or limited employment experience. Soon these pushcart peddler operations often evolved into fixed locations or scrapyards, where materials could be sorted and stored while awaiting favorable market conditions. Relatives and children added to the labor force and helped to build what would become family businesses. Today, many of these businesses continue to be family-owned and operated four or five generations later, while other firms have become part of large publicly held corporations. Many operations specialized in the ferrous scrap business, servicing mills in major industrial areas. In the late 1920s, these dealers formed a separate trade association, the Institute of Scrap Iron and Steel, or ISIS. Throughout the Great Depression, the industry struggled. Nevertheless, ISIS earned enough national recognition that President Herbert Hoover summoned industry leaders to the White House to discuss the conservation of natural resources. As efficiency increased, the busy scrap processing plant posed increasing challenges for worker safety. In response, ISIS initiated some of the earliest safety programs, including its annual Safety Week program. Association and industry emphasis on safety continues today with an array of tools for plant managers as well as standards that are part of Industry Rios plant certification. Following Pearl Harbor, the demand for industrial production catapulted the industry into public awareness. Citizens and industry alike were asked to do their part for the war effort. America, land of abundance, learns to mobilize its waste to save its scrap to provide more metals for war. Tin cans collected in one citywide salvage drive total more than a million pounds. A 55 car load contribution to the United Nations war effort. When processed, these cans will provide 11,000 pounds of pure tin, thousands of pounds of copper, both vital metals in the production of armament. Once largely unnoticed, the war brought both recognition of recyclers' tremendous contribution and resentment for profits earned during wartime. The scrap processors found themselves, not unlike the nation at large, fighting battles on two fronts. Association leaders served on the government's war production board to ensure that maximum efforts were being made to feed the war's voracious hunger for scrap metal, rubber, and other vital war production commodities. At the same time, however, government price controls, imposed for the first time on the industry, required the concerted efforts of these same association leaders to protect member interests. By war's end, however, the vital role recyclers played in firmly establishing America's industrial power 
was recognized and praised. In many respects, the war effort brought together many diverse interests and production efficiencies, and thereby firmly established scrap processing as a true industry and an essential part of the nation's economy. The public image of scrap recycling would continue to be of critical importance. Despite its role in conserving energy and natural resources, the industry is sometimes viewed as a dirty and dangerous business. The association has worked tirelessly to communicate a more accurate image. In the late 1950s, recyclers made one of the first moves in the Scrap is Not Waste campaign that continues today by changing the name of its Waste Paper Institute to the Paper Stock Institute of America. In the mid-1960s, the industry participated in the Johnson administration's effort to rid the nation of abandoned cars, and the association urged members to avoid using the word junk. In 1970, with the creation of the Environmental Protection Agency and a growing public focus on protecting the environment, the scrap industry was drawn into a struggle to protect its viability while complying with ever more stringent regulations. The full consequences of this wave of environmental legislation would begin to be felt by the industry in the mid-1980s, when often unintended consequences and poorly formed regulations threatened legitimate recycling operations with waste disposal requirements, heavy fines, and enormous costs for the cleanup of sites due to alleged arranging for the disposal of hazardous waste materials. In the past, the industry took a much more reactive approach to increased regulation of the industry. Um, however, since the late 1990s, ISRI has become much more proactive, always looking for opportunities to help advance the industry, whether through the Congressional Recycling Caucuses in Washington, or our grassroots work and all the work for our chapters on the state level, as well as all the work we've been doing internationally to help our members gain access to markets throughout the world. Through the combined efforts of industry members, ISRI has become the true voice of the recycling industry. Scrap recyclers were not always unified. In its infancy, the industry was highly competitive and wary of sharing trade secrets. Struggles with consumers of scrap in the early decades of the last century became the first motivation for collective action. The 1913 Association evolved to become the National Association of Recycling Industries, or NARI, and was inclusive of a range of scrap commodities. When ISIS was formed in 1928, the two organizations worked side by side for nearly 60 years. Then, twin forces of economic hard times in the 1980s, along with increased regulatory challenges, convinced the leadership to consider a merger. In 1987, the two organizations joined together to form the Institute of Scrap Recycling Industries, or ISRI, a clever splicing together of the two former names. The merger would open the doors to expansion of the commodities represented. Just as the industry has diversified over the last 25 years, so has the association. We've successfully integrated those companies that are recycling plastics, paper, electronics, and tires and rubber. At the close of the 20th century, major economic shifts reshaped the steel industry and other manufacturing. Widespread consolidation began to impact the recycling industries. Remaining ahead of the curve, ISRI embraced not only new commodity groups, but also expanded its reach to reflect the emerging global nature of the scrap recycling industry. In 2005, ISRI embarked on its first trade mission to China, focused on scrap paper. The ISRI Convention and Exposition draws an increasingly international audience from as far as China, India, and South America. Today's scrap recycling industry can be defined by its professionalism and its commitment to operating safely and also in an environmentally responsible manner. One of the most significant developments in the industry since the year 2000 has been the increased globalization of the industry. With as much as 40% of what the industry processes in the U.S. each year destined for markets throughout the world. Throughout its century-long history, the scrap recycling industry has evolved and adapted to ever-changing forces. Economic collapse and boom times, advances in technology, and a broad range of new materials, regulatory expansion, and self-regulation. What will the next hundred years hold for the recycling industry and ISRI? With the continued movement of people globally into the middle class, we can expect for the recycling industry to continue to grow into the future, while at the same time protecting the environment, preserving valuable natural resources, and contributing to the global economy. 
ISRI and the industry will continue the proud heritage of progress, innovation, and ingenuity, creating safe, profitable, and environmentally sound ways to recycle now and in the future.